Welcome everyone as you're joining. We'll just give it a few minutes to um, let everyone who's joining us tonight get into the room. We're gonna get started very shortly. We're just gonna, uh, we're seeing the numbers rise with participants. So we're gonna give it a minute for um, several, several people to join. So I will get started because it looks like we have reached, uh, people have entered. So my name is Antonella Scali. I'm the executive director of the Canadian Psoriasis Network. And it's my pleasure to, um, welcome you to our webinar event this evening, Treatment Updates for Psoriasis and Psoriatic Arthritis. This is the last webinar of the year for us, so we're really excited um, to have you here and to hear the um, great information from our speakers tonight. Just a few brief um, notes before we actually dive into the content uh, for housekeeping. So for those of you who prefer to listen in French, you can select the interpretation button at the bottom of the screen to toggle to select French. And these instructions are on the screen as well. The webinar is being recorded in English and French, and it will be posted for viewing shortly on our website, cpn-rcp.com. So if you miss any of it, or if you'd like to share, you can, um, you can do that. Um, because it's being recorded, all participants will be in listen-only mode for the duration of the session. So if you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A box or in the chat box, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Um, but you'll see there's a lot of content. So anything that we don't answer that we think can be answered afterward, we'll do our best to um, provide uh, questions after the fact and post them with the recording on our website. So. Um, as with all of our web webinars and resources, uh, we just want to be clear that the information in this presentation is general information only. So any personal or specific questions or concerns that you might have, especially around risks and benefits of any care or treatments for you, should be, of course, discussed with your healthcare provider. And the information that our presenters will be sharing tonight are based on their personal and professional perspectives and expertise. So we want to thank uh, Bristol Myers Squibb for their support of this webinar tonight. Um, and I'm happy to uh, get us started by introducing the Canadian Psoriasis Network to you, for those of you who don't know us yet. We are a national not-for-profit organization led by a board of directors made up primarily of people who live with severe forms of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And um, we put on education events like this one. Uh, we also um, provide awareness um, and advocacy for um, advancing the needs of people who live with psoriatic disease in Canada. And uh, you can find all of our uh, or all of our resources on our website, as I mentioned to you, including um, past webinars that we've done. So if this is your first time checking us out, welcome. And I encourage you to have a look at our website and see what other um, information you might find useful there. So you can also follow us on social media. All of our uh, handles are on the screen. And just a friendly uh, reminder that today is actually Giving Tuesday. So if you're able to, we are a not-for-profit organization. So in order for us to put these events on, uh, we do count on um, support of our funders and of our community uh, through donations. So if you're able to and um, you'd like to, um, please consider donating uh, as part of Giving Tuesday today. So without further ado, I'm very excited to turn it over to the content of our webinar for tonight. So this is a topic that whenever we survey our community about what, what kind of information would you like us to talk about in our, in our webinars, treatments and information about treatments about psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis is generally always number one. So what we've started to do is an annual kind of update on the treatment landscape in Canada because it's evolving. In the last you know couple of decades, and you'll hear a lot more from our speakers, the um, ability to treat psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis has evolved tremendously. And that still continues to change. Like new, new treatments become available um, in Canada 
regularly. So we really want to provide these updates um, annually um, to help you understand, you know, what, what does that look like? What is available to treat the conditions? And um, what does the horizon look like in terms of new treatments? Um, this because this is a big topic in, in and of itself, and we um, are we've added psoriatic arthritis to the agenda for for this year's webinar, which we're really grateful to do. Um, we're not going to be talking about you know navigating how to access uh, treatments. We're not going to be talking about um, other aspects of living well with psoriatic disease. So things like you know um, mental health, physiotherapy, uh, diet, and psoriasis. We have talked about those topics before. So again, I invite you, if you have an interest in any other areas around living well with psoriatic disease, to please check out our, our website and you can find all of our um, posted webinars there. And I also want to mention, you know, um, we have a diverse audience. So we may have people who've never had treatments before we and others that have tried several treatments throughout their uh their their condition so just a reminder again when we do do q a um these we won't be focusing on specific questions about specific um uh situations or circumstances but we'll answer more generally and we hope that in the presentations that our um, speakers will be sharing with you tonight there will be something for everyone to to learn from and to be able to have more informed conversations with your doctors so with that welcome again um i'm very much look forward to turning it over to our first speaker tonight so dr ashley sutherland as i introduce you please do share your screen um, Dr. Sutherland is an academic dermatologist working in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She sees both pediatric and adult patients in her practice with clinics at the VG and IWK hospitals. She completed medical school and dermatology residence at Dalhousie University and a master's of science at the University of Calgary. She's currently the program director of the Dalhousie Dermatology Residency Program, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you tonight and to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Antonella. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. I'm really excited to be here. I think, um, as Antonella mentioned, the treatment of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis right now, and over the last 10 years or so, has just skyrocketed. And we now have amazing therapies that we can offer patients. And that's only becoming more complicated, but exciting at the same time as the years are going on. So we're going to dive into this because it is a big topic to cover. Quick disclosures. So um, I haven't received any compensation for this presentation, but I do a lot of speaking and advising for most of the companies that would make our biologics for psoriasis. Um, that's to give my input and feedback into these companies to make it a really great experience for patients, make sure that their medication is being used to its highest potential. And I'll just say most of the pictures I've used in this presentation are from a website called DermNet NZ New Zealand. It is a really great resource if people are looking for online content. This is one that we typically use in our dermatologic community. So the objectives for this are really to look at the rationale, sort of the landscape of treatments for psoriasis in Canada, but with the rationale for why certain treatments are chosen for plaque psoriasis specifically or versus other types of psoriasis. I would like to go through a bit of this algorithm that we have for psoriasis in Canada and understand why we would use one over the other and how they all fit together. And it is a, a very big topic. I'll say this is a topic that is going to be difficult to fit into 20 minutes, but I will do my best. And I completely agree with what Antonella had said Treatment and management of psoriasis is very multifactorial. It takes a multidisciplinary approach for your lifestyle management, for your health and well-being overall. You know, there's a lot of comorbidities like other health issues that can go along with psoriasis. Managing those is part of this. So this is really just a small snapshot and looking at the medical therapies and kind of the, the prescription therapies specifically to get into tonight. First of all, I did just want to touch on psoriasis specifically because why we choose their treatment options really is dependent on the pathophysiology of psoriasis and why psoriasis happens because we're getting very good at targeting psoriasis in these treatments. So how I typically describe it to patients is that psoriasis is what we call an autoimmune disease. That means that the inflammation from psoriasis is being triggered within your own body. We know that patients typically have a bit of an a genetic predisposition. We don't know what those genetic factors are specifically yet, but typically there is some gene that predisposes. And then this switch gets flipped in someone's life. We don't know what the trigger is that happens. Could be stress or uh, infection or some other environmental thing. We don't know. 
but once it gets turned on, it's on. So we don't have a cure for psoriasis at this point, but we do have really amazing treatment options for patients that are life-saving and, and life-changing really. So with psoriasis, the, the reason we pick certain treatments over others can be based on many different things. So the psoriasis subtypes is one of them. We know that psoriasis can affect multiple different areas of the body and multiple different subtypes. The most common one that we would see is our typical plaque psoriasis. So that's, you know, a symmetrical, really well-defined red, white, scaly plaque, usually on our extensor arms and legs, sometimes the lower back, and typically on the kind of outside of the arms and the fronts of the legs. It can go other places on the trunk as well, but that would be the classic areas. We have the special sites, so we refer to them as special sites, this would be scalp psoriasis, really, very really common, and especially in the more pediatric population, I see a lot of scalp psoriasis. Nail psoriasis, really stubborn disease to treat, very difficult. Genital psoriasis obviously has a lot of, um, you know, negative implications for patients and their quality of life. Inverse psoriasis is typically in what we call folds of skin, so under the armpits, in the groin area, in the belly button. And then guttate psoriasis is its own kind of special type of psoriasis that really has this major explosion, typically after a strep infection. So like a strep throat or something similar. And that can come up very suddenly and be very widespread. And these pictures are just a few examples of some of these subtypes. So nail psoriasis, inverse psoriasis, scalp psoriasis, and guttate psoriasis. So when we look at our treatment options, our goal is to really look at what's happening in the skin. So we know that the plaques of psoriasis are due to an overactive immune and inflammatory signaling pathway. This means those psoriatic skin cells are actually dividing and turning over much too quickly. So in psoriasis, it's a four day process and in non-psoriasis skin, it's 27 days. So that's why you're getting these big buildup of plaques on the skin because that skin cells is just turning over very quickly. This causes thickening, scaling and flaking and redness, and that can be very itchy because of the inflammation as well. So when we look at our treatments, we really try and act on that inflammatory pathway to make the skin act a bit more normally. So normalize it to the point of closer to the 27 day turnover cycle. That reduces the inflammation under the skin, the itch that's happening, it gets rid of some of that redness. And we do this in a number of different ways, but typically, applying actual anti-inflammatory medications directly on the skin in something like a topical therapy or an ultraviolet light, or by giving medications that target really specific proteins as part of this pathway. So I'm going to get into this. Sorry, I'm getting on the thing. That again. Okay. So looking at our overview of treatments, we do have a lot of treatments for skin psoriasis. Um, I'll, I'll kind of just go through, but I'll say like, this is just a bit of a snapshot again. So we're talking about multiple options, even within these categories. In our topical treatments, the mainstay is still our topical corticosteroids. And I will talk about those a little bit more. We have our vitamin D analog. So typically this would be something like Dovinex and Dovibet, and I'll get into that too. We have vitamin A combinations. We have topical calcineurin inhibitors. We have anti-PDE4 inhibitors or phosphodiesterase 4. Um, and that would be most of our topical things. We'll use phototherapy, and I'll chat about that as well. Conventional immunosuppressants is how we label our typical methotrexate, cyclosporin, or acetretin, which is an oral retinoid or vitamin A pill. There's other oral medications that we can use. One is called Apremolast or Otesla, and another is called Ducravacitinib, and that's a bit newer on the market or so tick to, and then biologics. And I have lots of slides coming up about all these therapies. So to get into our topical corticosteroids, I think when most people will see their healthcare practitioner, whether it's primary care in like a family physician or a nurse practitioner, or even a dermatologist, topical steroids are really still our mainstay of treatment. We've used them for a very long time and they do still work very well. They can range in strength from mild to super potent. And I put this very small table on the right side of the slide because it just shows you multiple options that we have in our topical steroid chart and then different formulations within that. So we have creams and ointments and lotions and sprays and foams and oils. And we use these different vehicles, we call it, in different areas of the body. So ointments work great because they penetrate into the skin better. They're more hydrating. Creams are nicer during the daytime, especially for the hands because they do blend in a bit more. Lotions are preferred for the scalp. There's oils that we can use for the scalp as well. So Within our topical steroids, there's a whole spectrum that we use and we kind of 
pick our choices based on our vehicle and our strength based on where it is on the body, the thickness of the plaque, a whole bunch of different factors. When we get into our topical therapies, otherwise, we have vitamin D analogs. So this will be our calcipotriene or Dovonex. This is one that's pretty good for sensitive areas of the skin. So typically in our folds of skin um, or on the face, it's not overly powerful. So I like to explain to patients that it doesn't have much of a punch to it. So it's much better for mild disease or maintenance therapy. So when the disease is much better controlled, this is for a longer term maintenance treatment. Calcipotriol, which is more Dovibet or Instelar. It's calcipotriene, so your vitamin D analog, but we also have a corticosteroid mixed in with that. So it's the combination of steroid and vitamin D. And that works very well because um, you get the combination of the two medications in one. That's really a good first line as well. A lot of family physicians, for example, will still use Dovibet first line or Instelar foam, and they are great medications as well. We have vitamin A topical agents that we can use, so different retinoids we call them. Um, Duobri would be one example of this, where we have our vitamin A mixed in with a very strong corticosteroid. And when I say strong, I actually mean like very effective, um, not strong in a negative way by any means. It works really well for stubborn and thick plaques. And in this one, the vitamin A is supposed to counteract the side effects of the steroid and the steroid actually counteracts the side effects of the vitamin A. So they're both supposed to both work together to make a nice topical agent um, that has very little in the way of side effects if used properly. And I find that most people do like it for, for certain areas of the body, like their elbows and knees. We have our topical calcineurin inhibitors. So these are medications like Eladel and Protopic and our topical phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor, which is a bit newer on the market, or Zorib. These again are not steroid based. They're non-steroid anti-inflammatories. I also describe this one to patients as a bit um, milder or better for maintenance treatments or better for sensitive areas. You know, these are the medications that'll typically be described for genital psoriasis, for example, or psoriasis in the belly button, or just like if it's on the face, then that it's a really nice one to use there because that's not thick areas of skin. You don't need something with a lot of power and you don't want to cause some of those side effects that you could have with overuse or misuse of topical corticosteroids, like thinning of the skin or stretch marks. So the topical calcineurins and the anti-PDE4 inhibitors are really nice for those sensitive areas. One of the topical therapies, there's actually a few topical therapies that I did not include in this. One would be salicylic acid, which is something that we'll sometimes mix in with some of our um, combination or the compounded medications. Salicylic acid is really nice to help get rid of some of that extra thickness and flakiness. We sometimes use LCD and that's a tar-based derivative. Um, we'll add that in as well in some of our compounded therapies. It's really stinky. It's, you know, greasy, but it works pretty well. So for feet, for example, we'll give people an LCD combination to put on their feet at bedtime with socks over top and it smells terrible and people don't love it, but it does work. It's an old school one, but it does still work. So that would sort of round out most of our topical therapy options. Phototherapy is another treatment that we've had for quite a long time in the dermatology world. Um, these are some pictures that I actually took of our phototherapy units here in Halifax. So this is our narrow band UVB phototherapy unit on the outside and then opened up so you see what it's like inside. And then the hand and foot unit. So this is an example of a UVA hand and foot unit. So phototherapy is something that we'll use if we want to do like a full body treatment. Um, and in someone that maybe has contraindications for other systemic medications. So if you have a lot of your body covered in psoriasis, it's very difficult to put creams and ointments on that much. It's like a full-time job twice a day to try and get yourself all lathered up in a topical therapy. So phototherapy is a really nice way to just treat your whole body. It's usually seconds to minutes in the booth. But the downside to it is that when you start the process, you're usually doing it for weeks to months you know usually we'll check in after about six weeks of treatment and see how it's going and sometimes people will be doing this for months at a time and it's usually three to five times a week for some people so it is a really difficult thing to add into someone's schedule if they have a job or they're in school um, and if you're not close to one of these units which you know it varies across Canada about access to these um, it's very difficult so there is kind of hand and foot specific units. There's a scalp comb, which is actually just like a, a big plastic comb with lights on the end of it. Doesn't work great, but we have it as an option. Um, so phototherapy is still something that we'll use on occasion. It works really well for something like guttate psoriasis, which is that really fast onset post-streptococcal bacterial infection psoriasis. 
I'll jump to our conventional immunosuppressants. So usually when I'm talking to patients, I say, you know, step one of the ladder is our topical therapies. And then we'll typically go to something like phototherapy or one of the other immune suppressing medications. These are the ones that are more pill-based, so an oral medication. And there's really three in this category that we'd go to in the first line of treatment. And I'll kind of say maybe two actually, because I don't think many of us, at least here in Nova Scotia, use cyclosporin. The more common one will be methotrexate or acetretin if you don't have contraindications. Really, this is one that you wouldn't use if you were childbearing years as a female um, or if you have really any major issues with triglycerides, cholesterol, liver problems. So methotrexate, cyclosporin, and acetretin will be our conventional treatments. We use these in a lot of areas of medicine, a lot of areas in dermatology specifically, but they use them a lot in rheumatology, as you hear, in different areas of hematology, for example. Um, you know, nephrology uses some of these. So there's a lot of areas that these medications are used for. So there's a bunch of data on safety. Generally, these have good effect. You know, they do work for a lot of people, but they do have side effects that people will have not infrequently. And typically, we we do have to do more frequent monitoring. So each of these will have different implications with blood work and follow-up visits and, and contraindications and things we might watch for and look for. Um, so it is a bit more of a complicated process to be on these medications. And they only are kind of a so-so a treatment for the, the skin psoriasis. So we don't love them. The flip side of that is a lot of our private and provincial drug plans will require you to have tried and failed or have a contraindication to one of these medications before you can apply for access to one of our newer biologic medications. So it is a bit of a hoop to jump through and most people will have to try these for at least a short amount of time to see if it has effect. Um, and then typically we'll have access to move on to our biologic medications. There are a few other oral medications. So these are medications that we'll use typically, again, one step past our conventional medications because these medications are also quite expensive and they do have a lot of um, you know, implications with regards to access. So we will typically have to try and fail something like methotrexate before we can access these medications, but they are still a pill-based medication and they are better. They do work better and they're specifically studied for psoriasis, which is great. So two options here are a premolast and ducravacitinib. A premolast is an anti-PDE4 inhibitor, so phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor. This pill is taken twice a day. It, it does work well, but there are some side effects to consider. So headache, diarrhea, weight loss, depression. Um, and it, we've had it on the market for a good number of years now, and it works pretty good for psoriasis. With ducravacitinib, this one just came out recently this year. It is a different class of medication called a TIC2 inhibitor, and the name that it goes by is SOTIC2. This is once a day pill. It really has very good effect. Like I, I think the results are quite promising for this one, but it is new. So we don't have a lot of that longevity data. We don't know more of that long term, you know, does it actually hold good effect for a long time? We're not really sure yet. Um, but with this one, the kind of big feature is that we don't really have much side effects that we're watching for based on the studies and the data we have so far. And there's no major workup or monitoring needed before starting this medication. So this might be a great medication for someone that does have some contraindications or a needle phobia, for example. Both of these would be really good if people have concerns about getting a regular needle because they are pill-based and they do have good effect and are specifically studied and indicated for psoriasis. I put in a table of our biologic medications. So biologics really are this great new class of medications that we have that are very specific at targeting parts of our psoriasis inflammatory pathway. So different characteristics and different types, and you'll see that in sort of our third um, column here. So some of our medications are TNF alpha inhibitors, some are IL-12-23 inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors, and then specific IL-23 inhibitor. And these are very specific proteins that they know are part of the pathogenic pathway for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, as you'll hear, and now we're learning more about Crohn's disease and another condition called hydrogenase suppurativa. Really all of these kind of autoimmune inflammatory cluster of diseases that we see, a lot of these are getting cross-indicated for. So you'll hear about them more tonight as well. And there are some that they will use in rheumatology that we don't have and vice versa. 
biologics are generally, these ones are needle-based. There is one in IV infusion, which is Remicade or infliximab. Um, we've had biologic medications now since around probably 2005, maybe a little bit before that, and when they've been in studies or, or shortly after. So we do have good long-term data now for many of these medications, and they're just getting more and more um, approved as time goes on. So at this point, we have a lot of really great options and really good safe options. And it's becoming a bit of an art form to figure out which of these medications is gonna be right for our patients in which setting. So what I wanted to do here is just give you an overview of the options because these are the, the medications that I would hope your physician would touch on or at least consider when they're thinking about a specific case. And these considerations on the right are my particular thoughts um, that I would help to use to differentiate one medication over another. There are some other medications that we know have really good data with other conditions like psoriatic arthritis for Humira, for example. Um, Simsia or Sertilizumab is the one biologic we have that has had actual very good quality studies done for pregnancy and breastfeeding. In our IL-17 class of medications and our IL-23 class of medications, those are really our newest ones that do have the best overall efficacy and good safety. The IL-17s typically have a little bit more of a side effect of yeast, so specifically like oral candidiasis yeast. Um, so sometimes that will come up as a bit of a side effect for people. And for bradalumab or Salique, this is a really good effective interleukin-17 medication. But back in the studies, it had a few cases, uh, like actually two cases of depression and suicide that when they look back, were not found to be linked to the medication at all. But it did get labeled with this black box warning. So that one does typically get passed over in a lot of discussions, but is a really great, safe and effective option. And I have multiple patients on it myself. So I feel a little bit bad for that medication because it get, got a bit, bit of a bad shake of the stick. The 23 IL-23 inhibitors, we have great options for there as well. They really are very good and very safe and very effective. Um, for example, Rizinkizumab or Skyrizi is one of these every three month injections and it's shown really great response in Crohn's disease. Um, the IL-23 inhibitor Illumia is relatively new. It's another th every three month injection. Trimphiagasalcumab is a fantastic medication every eight weeks and it works quite well as well. So when you're talking to your physician now, we will likely go in the psoriasis world primarily to one of the IL-17s or IL-23s first line. And typically we'll, for psoriasis specifically, um, not start a TNF-alpha inhibitor usually. Again, this is my own kind of personal perspective and it will vary across Canada but just based on the safety and efficacy, it would be my preference to go for one of the newer ones. So just going to briefly talk about some upcoming therapies. They're studying a ton of biologics. There's no way I could talk about them all tonight. And I don't even know most of them because they're just coming down the pipeline and we're just getting them as they come. But I will just briefly touch on spazolamab. This is a newly approved uh, medication for generalized pustular psoriasis, which is a really kind of severe, very in explosive type of pustular psoriasis. So psoriasis, but with all these little pussy bumps in the skin, people can get very unwell with this medication, have to be admitted to hospital, need IV fluids, a lot of kind of check their vitals. Um, so now we have this infusion that targets another protein, so interleukin 36, and it's a single IV infusion um, and it's indicated and it works very well. I haven't had the chance to use it yet because this is a very rare condition, but it is a very exciting development in the dermatology world. And unfortunately, it has not shown great evidence for a lot of our other types of pustular psoriasis. So some people can get pommel plantar pustular psoriasis. Uh, it doesn't work as well for that. So that is really sort of my very quick overview of a lot of medications. And I'm happy to take some questions when we're all done at the end of this. Thank you so much, Dr. Sutherland. There are amazing questions coming in. So I hope um, we, we look forward to talking to you again uh, and to go over some of them. Thank you so much for that uh, brief overview and, and you really hit on a, a lot of important uh, updates. And so with that, if you can stop sharing your screen, it's gonna be my pleasure to invite Dr. Chandran to bring his uh, slides up as I introduce you. And actually, Dr. Chandran, as, uh, as I welcome you. I just want to point out the one question that came in that I think you're going to touch on because you are going to talk about psoriatic arthritis. Um, but there's one question about the difference between psoriatic arthritis and osteoarthritis. So if you can please touch on that, maybe when you're introducing the psoriatic arthritis background, that would be great. 
Um, but just for those of you who don't know Dr. Chandran yet, um, he is a rheumatologist, a clinician, and a clinician scientist at the Kremble Research Institute, and an associate professor of medicine and la in laboratory medicine and pathobiology at the University of Toronto. He's an expert in psoriatic arthritis and directs the psoriatic disease program at the Schroeder Arthritis Institute. His translational research program is focused on developing prote proteomics and metabolomics based diagnostic and prognostic tools for psoriatic arthritis with support by grants from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the National Psoriasis Foundation, the Arthritis Society and the Kremble Foundation. He's published more than 200 papers. He's a member of the executive committee of the group for research and assessment of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis and co-chairs its research committee and he still finds time to help out organizations like ours and so with that thank you and I turn it over to you Dr. Chandran. Thanks Antanla I don't know where you got that from but thanks anyway uh, these are my disclosures uh, I, I do get some support from many um, of the companies that make these advanced therapeutics uh, and my wife also works for AstraZeneca so that I, I got lots of conflicts of interest but I'll try to be as objective as possible and of course, you can ask me if um, there are some doubts regarding that. And as mentioned, I also get a lot of grants from many other agencies that support my research. So I thought I'll begin with talking about what psoriatic arthritis is and, you know, uh, touch on one of the questions that Antonella mentioned. So, so what is psoriatic arthritis? It's an inflammatory arthritis and a form of spondyloarthritis, which is associated with psoriasis. So um, as opposed to the most common form of arthritis, osteoarthritis, which is also has some inflammation, but is generally considered uh, the, the, the inflammation that is part of that form of arthritis is secondary to injuries and wear and tear, which seem to accumulate over time. Uh, this particular form of arthritis is an autoimmune um, or immune-mediated arthritis that affects not just the joints, but also the bones, the tendons and ligaments, and I'll, I'll describe that. And so um, quite different from osteoarthritis. Now, what is spondyloarthritis? It's, uh, it's also called SPA for a short, uh, in, a, in, a, in a short form. It affects many joints. It could affect um, the spine as well as the peripheral joints. So for example, it could affect the joints of the fingers, uh, the knees, and it tends to occur on in joints that have more um, biomechanical stress or pressure on it. So um, the BIP joints, the end joints of the fingers, the knees, the hips uh, are, are common sites of involvement, as well as the spine. And in the spine, especially the sacroiliac joints, the joint at the in the you know the lower part of the spine here in the pelvis um it also affects the vertebral column uh, in the lumbar spine or the cervical spine other areas that are affected are where tendons and ligaments attach to bone uh, that site is called enthesis and when there is inflammation there it's called enthesitis the common sites are where the achilles tendon inserts to the back of the calcaneum uh uh, insertion of the plantar fascia to the calcaneum, also called plantar fasciitis. Um, the uh, you know tennis elbow and golfer's elbow inflammation, where the uh, muscles attached to the sides of the elbow, are also common sites of this condition. And sometimes, especially in the fingers and toes, uh, the the joints, the bone, the soft tissue, the tendons, and the covering of the tendons all get inflamed, and that leads to a swelling of the entire finger or toe, and that's called dactylitis. And, um, you know, in common parlance, it's also called sausage digit. So these are the features of spondyloarthritis. And when you have spondyloarthritis associated with psoriasis, we call it psoriatic arthritis. It's just showing you all that. And this particular form of spondyloarthritis and spondyloarthritis in general are associated with other autoimmune diseases. And when uh, the skin is affected, uh, usually with psoriasis, we call it psoriatic arthritis. You could have inflammation in the gut, uh, le leading to what's called Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. You can have inflammation in the eye, called uveitis. And therefore, patients with psoriatic disease have many manifestations. 
Not all manifestations are present in each patient and the manifestations in each area of the body are quite uh, diverse and therefore there's a lot of heterogeneity, which makes it a challenge for diagnosis as well as treatment. Now, for example, the skin can be quite diverse. You can have small, uh, tiny plaques on your elbow or knee, for example, which does not cause much of a bother or a small you know, spot in your scalp or umbilicus, or you can have very extensive areas of psoriasis as depicted in the picture here. You could have pustular lesions, like Ashley mentioned, which could be uh, on the skin and sometimes quite severe, but also in on the palms and soles, so-called palmoplantar pustulosis. Uh, when uh, the whole skin is involved, more than 90% of the skin is involved and it's red and um, uh, extensive and the patient quite sick, this is called psoriatic erythroderma. And there are of course other causes of erythroderma. So the skin itself is quite heterogeneous. And then you can have nail disease and there are very many different types of nail disease um, in patients with psoriatic disease. And then of course the joints can be quite, um, uh, involvement can be quite diverse with peripheral joints, the spine, dactylitis, enthesitis, and sometimes quite destructive arthritis, what we call arthritis mutilans, where the bones, you know, get um, lysed away. And so the fingers or toes become really short. And as mentioned, some patients have inflammation in the eye and inflammation in the gut. So uh, what are the features um, that distinguish psoriatic arthritis from other forms of arthritis, including osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis? Uh, the number of joints that are, can be affected could be, we could go from one to um, almost all the joints. We typically count about uh, 70 uh, joints, so 68 joints. And so all of them could be affected, but thankfully not usually. Uh, some patients, uh, usually, typically it begins with one joint and gradually other joints get affected. When the joints are affected, it's um, uh, it looks red and inflamed. Uh, come, uh, and that differs, differentiates it from osteo, where osteoarthritis, where um, there is more bony bony proliferation, less of fluid, and usually no redness or inflammation. Any joint could be affected, and the typical ones are the DIP joints, as shown in the middle finger here, as well as the finger in the lower left bottom here. You can see that the DIP, meaning the joint in the um, next to the nail, the still inter interphalangeal joint, and you can see the redness. That is associated with it. And when you look carefully at this uh, finger using MRI, for example, you'll see that the joint is inflamed, the nail bed is inflamed, as well as the, the bone, the distal phalanx is um, uh, inflamed. That can lead to very destructive changes, as I mentioned earlier. And those pictures on the right uh, describe arthritis mutilans, which thankfully, um, due to early diagnosis and better management, we see less and less often now can affect the spine and cause really stiff, uh, painful spine with very limited mobility. Uh, it could affect the lower spine, lower part of the spine or the neck. And so uh, that should be something that we should be looking for, uh, especially when there is peripheral arthritis. It's rare to have just spinal involvement without involvement of the joints of the hands and feet. You can have dactylitis, I mentioned earlier, and the whole tissues in the finger is, or toe is inflamed and you can see the whole finger being inflamed in these pictures, the middle one here, the second one here, and the second one over here, and, and the fourth toe in the photo picture. So all the, you know, the joint, the bone, the tendon sheets, all of that is inflamed when you have a sausage digit. Enthesitis uh, typically affects the heel, so where the tendon, Achilles tendon attaches to the bone. One thing to remember is that tendonitis, which is inflammation of the tendon, is quite common um, and uh, in the general population. But when you have enthesitis, there is inflammation where the tendon attaches to the bone right at the bottom here. And you can have either uh, inflammation where the Achilles inserts, so Achilles enthesitis, or where the plantar fascia inserts, or the so-called so plantar fasciitis. And then, um, of course, uh, by definition, most people have psoriasis, but there are there's a small percentage of patients who have psoriatic arthritis without psoriasis. So that too can happen. And it's typically in family members, somebody else in the family has psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis. 
Um, and, and so it's always important to get the family history when somebody comes with arthritis, uh, even if there is no psoriasis. And nail disease is quite common in psoriatic disease, uh, but particularly common in patients with psoriatic arthritis. So somebody has psoriasis and nail disease, it's always important to ask about psoriatic arthritis or ask about joint pain, back pain. I mentioned other inflammatory conditions such as uveitis and Crohn's disease, um, typically presenting with eye pain and blurring vision when there is eye involvement or abdominal pain, diarrhea and blood in stool when there is a gastrointestinal involvement. So this is inflammatory bowel disease, not irritable bowel syndrome, uh, which is a completely uh, very different condition. So the question, of course, is how is PSA diagnosed? So it is usually diagnosed by a rheumatologist because it is difficult to differentiate inflammatory arthritis from non-inflammatory arthritis uh, by non-specialists. Uh, what we need is careful clinical examination. You should take a history about all the manifestations that I mentioned, like joint pain, back pain, sausage digits, uh, heel pain, elbow pain re related to enthesitis, and then do a careful clinical examination, basically trying to figure out if the joint involvement is inflammatory or um, normal or some other cause of arthritis, say uh, osteoarthritis. And the, an important thing is to identify inflammatory disease. The problem with psoriatic arthritis is many patients with active inflammation, almost 50% of patients with clearly active inflammation, their blood markers of inflammation like CRP is not elevated. So if you rely on blood work for inflammation, you might uh, not be able to diagnose it. Um, and so uh, sometimes it happens that you have psoriasis and joint pain. You ask your family doctor about arthritis, you do a blood test, which is typically rheumatoid factor and CRP. Uh, rheumatoid factor is a marker for rheumatoid arthritis, which is usually negative in psoriatic arthritis. And you look at inflammatory markers, and if that's normal, the conclusion is that, oh, this is just joint pain, maybe osteoarthritis, don't worry about it. But you uh, only by careful clinical examination that you might be able to pick it up. And that's why I say that a rheumatologist probably is the best person to evaluate uh, if there is a suspicion for psoriatic arthritis. And sometimes it's difficult. So we rely on x-rays, ultrasound, and MRIs to really look for that inflammation in the joints and the spine. Unfortunately, there are no diagnostic tests and occasionally it is present without psoriasis. So, so that's also a challenge. So once a diagnosis is made, of course, we need to treat it. And how do you treat it? It's very important about education. The, the seminars that we are having helps people understand the condition. Uh, and we also do this with dermatologists, with primary care and other specialists who the, uh, have, you know, who patients with psoriasis may be seeing. General health measures are important, like stopping smoking, exercise, weight management, sleep and stress management. And of course, medications are important. And for minor disease or for symptom, symptom management, we use anti-inflammatory drugs. There are many of them in the market. And um, uh, corticosteroids are used usually with intraarticular injections, uh, just like we use, uh, you know, for to we prefer not to give oral or injectable, um, you know, uh, parenteral steroids. For the skin, we can use topical therapy and for the joints, you can inject inside the joint, but tablets or injections uh, for, uh, full, uh, you know, for an effect over all the body is not a good idea because there's generally more side effects to that. And, and by the steroids are not very effective for psoriatic disease. And of course, if these are um, not effective or the disease is severe, then we need to use immunomodulatory drugs, what we call disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Um, I guess the better terminology is immunomodulatory drugs. And there are many conventional drugs. And th that is usually first line. We use methotrexate as tablets or injections, usually once a week. And um, that ha has somewhat good efficacy for skin and um, joint disease. Uh, but it takes up typically three to six months to show good efficacy for the joints. Other drugs which are similar are sulfasalazine and leflunamide. Now, these drugs uh, are usually given first line because they have been we have been using it for almost 50 years now, maybe leflunamide about 30 years. Uh, and we know their side effects and they are quite uh, cheap. And uh, I would say a minority of patients have a very good response to it. So that's usually... Uh, mandated by the payers to be tried first um, before we go on to more uh, newer therapies. 
uh, what what Ashley just described, what we call advanced therapies. And there for psoriatic arthritis, almost all the drugs that uh, Dr. Sutherland described are applicable for um, um, treatment of the arthritis. So they are the anti-TNF agents of which biosimilars are now available. I saw some questions about that and we can discuss that. Um, um, these are essentially similar to the originator compounds uh, and these are available for infliximab and adalimumab. Um, uh, these were introduced after the patent for the originator molecules expired and have been shown to be as safe and effective. There are other agents. Um, we do have abatacept, which, which we do not use a lot and is not used in psoriasis, which has some efficacy for psoriatic arthritis, but I think in normal practice, there, is, uh, there are two patients on this, this drug. Most of the drugs that we use, apart from the anti-TNF agents, are those that talk, uh, target the uh, type 3 immunity pathway, TH17 pathway, and these include Istikinumab, secukinumab, ixikizumab, gusilkimab, and resenkizumab, which uh, Dr. Sutherland just mentioned. And um, all of them have uh, excellent efficacy on the skin. Um, and uh, coming to advanced oral therapy, we have the PD info, PDE4 inhibitor, apremilast, and the JAK inhibitor, tofacitum and upadacitinib, which um, apremilast is available for psoriasis. But the JAK inhibitor, these two that I've mentioned here, are not um, available. Uh, uh, and ducravacitinib, which is available in dermatology, is being, um, you know, it's undergoing trials for the arthritis at the moment. And um, there are other some other drugs that I've not mentioned here, uh, which again, trials have been completed, and but we do not have access to it yet, uh, particularly uh, BIMS, uh, Bimekizumab. The one thing to remember, uh, for Dr. Sutherland said that, say, the drugs targeting the TH17 pathway are very effective for psoriasis and are better than the anti-TNF agents, and therefore they don't use the anti-TNF agents anymore. But when it comes to arthritis, all these drugs, except apremilast and abatacept, which are less effective for the arthritis compared to the rest, but the, uh, except for these two, all the other drugs have equal efficacy in arthritis. So if this joint disease is the only problem or the major problem, the skin disease is not much of a problem, we choose any of these drugs um, depending on the other risk factors such as the risk of infection or uh, what comorbidities the patients have. So um, we, no drug has been shown to be better. So the uh, drugs targeting the TH17 pathway, like say sikikinumab or exikizumab, is not better than etanercept for the arthritis. And they have been head-to-head -head studies trying to show a difference which and did not demonstrate that. So that's important when we talk about uh, arthritis management. How do we treat psoriatic arthritis? Uh, what we do is we assess not just the joints, but also the skin and the nails. And we, of course, would need help of the dermatologist to do that. Um, and we also look at the spine. Uh, so we have these uh, domains that I can I'll briefly mention. The aim is to get the disease activity as low as possible in any of these domains. So we look at the most active domain, choose a drug that helps that domain, but also uh, reduces the uh, disease activity if present in other domains. And of course, we have to have that um, decision made uh, jointly between the patient and the clinician. So these are the domains that uh, are important. So I, I showed you peripheral arthritis, the back, the enthesis, like the heel and uh, the elbows, dactylitis or sausage digit, the psoriasis and nail disease. And so what we do with for each patient is that we evaluate all these domains to see which is the most active. And based on that, we choose a therapy. So for example, if the um, uh, peripheral joints like the wrist and knees are problematic, we initially start with NSAIDs and injections if required. Um, but if it is severe, we immediately start treatment with conventional DMARs, either methotrexate or sulfasalazine or leflunamide. Typically, one does not work. Insurance companies ask us to try another one. Um, but the general recommendations are that one such trial is sufficient. And if that doesn't work, then we can choose any of the biologics that I mentioned earlier. Uh, including the TNF or IL-23 or IL-17 or IL-20 uh, inhibitors. And if th those do not work, we, um, we can go to the JAK inhibitors. And if one of them fail, we can try another one. So that's so it's important to evaluate all domains. 
look for the most act active domain and treat that domain, keeping the other domains in mind. And we can discuss this further in the Q&A. And what um, advocacy agencies can do, uh, organizations can do is to get that awareness over in, in seminars like this. Also talking to family physicians and dermatologists. Uh, we really need early diagnosis to improve outcomes and lack of a diagnostic test kind of impedes that. And um, uh, when seeing your family doctor or dermatologist, always mention that if you have joint pain or anthesial pain, and if there is a doubt about arthritis, ask for a referral. And when you see a rheumatologist, Mention all your symptoms, the joints, any sausage digit, back pain, neck pain, heel pain, elbow pain. It's really important. And if, if the doctor does not insist on completely examining you properly, insist on disrobing so that they can see your skin properly, remove footwear so they can look at your feet properly and do a proper assessment because you can have inflammatory disease there. And if the feet are not examined, the diagnosis may be completely missed. Also, List all your other comorbid conditions that you might have, like blood pressure or diabetes, because that's important. And then all the medication that you've started and when did you stop and what response and side effects that you had. All that is important so that a proper assessment is made. And so to summarize, I've tried to explain what psoriatic arthritis is and how it is different from other conditions. The challenges, the diagnosis requires a careful evaluation by a rheumatologist. There are no diagnostic tests. And for treatment, you need to evaluate all the domains that I mentioned direct the treatment to the most problematic domain, but keeping the other domains in mind. And um, for arthritis, most of the drugs, the advanced therapies that we have are pretty much equal. And so the dis decision of which drug to choose may depend on how bad the psoriasis is, or if you have uh, you know, Crohn's disease or other comorbidities um, like some indolent infection, for example. With that, I'll stop and I'm happy to have a conversation, discussion, and take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chandran, as well, for bringing us through all of that in such a short amount of time. Um, I, I think what we'll do um, to respect everyone's time, particularly our translator, is go through the questions in order. And if we don't get them all, because they're all really good, um, then what I, we can do is actually bring them back and post them if you're willing to help us, maybe answer them offline and post them afterward for uh, with the recording. So we'll get through as many of these as we can. One, I think very important one that came in earliest was about biosimilars, um, because we know that this, these policies are changing across Canada. We have information, which I'm gonna pop in the chat, um, but any um, comments on biosimilars that will be the least shock to the system? Um, if any comments there in terms of making the decision about which biosimilar to choose, even though my understanding is that they are all going to work essentially the same way we hope, like like one to the other. Um, but any thoughts that you have as as um, specialists when you're thinking about the bios biosimilars that might be helpful, Dr. Sutherland, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, no, you're absolutely right. I, everything we know about biosimilars is that they should work identical to the trade version of itself. We were forced to use biosimilars starting last February, I believe, in Nova Scotia. So our our public system um, for Humira, for example, for adalimumab, we had that shift over last year. So I've actually had a good almost two years now with um, biosimilars for that specific medication. Really no specific changes for my patients. They It was a very smooth transition, I would say. Nobody had any new failures or problems with the medication. So in theory, everything we know about bio biosimilars is that they should work just as well as the biologics. Anything to add, Dr. Chandran, or should I move on to the next one? Yeah, I think uh, that is a lot of anxiety. It's, and there are a lot of biosimilars. The Humira, for example, has uh, six, I think. Uh, bio so which one to choose? Uh, there are no studies comparing between them. They've all compared to uh, Humira to show that it's it's essentially the same. So um, how we choose is um, uh, looking at how easy the access is. Some uh, you know there are patient support programs, etc. Which uh, as we get to know all the different ones, it helps us understand that. And we don't have any particular choice. But I think uh, rest assured, the you should not see any difference come from. Uh, Humira. And so, um, and at least in Ontario, if you have a problem, what the ministry says is that if you um, 
uh, and of course, rarely that is possible, then because there are many other options, try another one. And if you have problems with two um, different biosimilars, then then they would consider going, you know, funding the originator drug. So that that is, if required, there is an option to go back onto the originator. Thanks so much. Um, both great insights and really shows again that you know, there's all these different options and and still it comes down to how the individual responds, right? So so it's, it's, it's really helpful that we have different options available to people because of that. The individual eventually can respond uh, uniquely, right? Um, so one question about any specific treatment available for nail psoriasis. So we know this is such a hard, hard to treat uh, area. Mm -hmm. Again, I'll maybe start with Dr. Sutherland if you have any comments and then Dr. Chandran, because I know you see a lot of nail psoriasis with psoriatic arthritis too. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, it's really a very frustrating and stubborn condition on all aspects. When we think about nail psoriasis, I like to explain to patients that the inflammation that's causing the nail changes is from kind of back in the nail matrix, which is in the skin part before the nail. So that's deep down inflammation under the skin topical therapies just aren't going to work. You know, we, we could try and put all the good strong stuff on there. So topicals are out, phototherapies out. You're really looking at your systemic immunomodulatory drugs or biologics. And even then there are some studies in our biologics, for example, that have looked at the, the nail disease specifically, and some do theoretically work better than others. But just from the get go, if you're trying to target nail disease, you're looking at either methotrexate or biologic medication typically. Thank you so much. Anything you want to add, Dr. Chandran? Uh, uh, we are interested in the nail disease, not, because, not for treatment, which we leave to the dermatologist. It's mainly because you know it's an indicator that there might be uh, subclinical or uh, a higher risk for developing psoriatic arthritis. And so we, um, we see that as a marker for disease and for early diagnosis. Mm -hmm. okay. Any comments on how Canadian treatments and research compare with what is being used or done elsewhere in the world? Is there another country that you follow to see what they are doing for people with psoriatic arthritis? I mean, this is a whole big topic on its own. And I know, you know, you may not have um, particular insights to share tonight, because but if you have any thoughts on that, um, I welcome either of you to, to share. Anyone have any? Uh, I can go first. I must reassure all the people in the audience that Canada has been the forefront of research of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. We are a country now of only 40 million people, but uh, have had uh, outsized role um, in, in all the treatments that have come. So if you look at psoriasis, new treatments, clinical trials, who are the people who um, uh, publish and are world leaders in it, they're all Canadians, right from Ontario, to um, from coast to coast to coast, right? So, well, maybe not the <laughs> North <laughs> Coast, but coast to coast because you have Richard Langley, with, who's with Dr. Sutherland. There are people in Montreal, uh, Yves Poulin, for example, in Ontario, Dr. Um, uh, Kim Papp, and they've all been authors of, and conducting trials, uh, cutting its trials based on which all the treatles, treatments are available. And that's for psoriasis. When it comes to psoriatic arthritis, uh, a Toronto group uh, here, Dr. Gladman, to begin with, in the late 1970s, recognized that it's not just a minor arthritis that that um, is could be treated with some anti-inflammatories. It requires serious research and treatment and set up a cohort to prove to the world that it's a really severe disease. And we've been working on it for the last 40 years, 37, 38 years. And most of many of the discoveries that I've made have been through the research out of Toronto. So uh, we, you know, generally we are not looking outside. We of course look and discuss, but many people outside from outside are looking at us to see what we are doing and follow that. So we have been on the forefront, thankfully. Great. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to add, Dr. Sutherland. Super quickly, just like all of our big landmark studies are typically done at sites in Canada, US, Europe, across the world. So most, most big trials will have sites around the world. And then that data is used to get these medications on the market. Historically, I would say the FDA in the USA is a bit faster getting things approved. So typically, if something gets approved in the States, Health Canada is shortly behind that for getting approval. So we can kind of look to the US about how they've approached approving these medications to see how it'll be. That's kind of not a hard and fast rule, but 
typically how it's worked. Excellent. Excellent. And then I will end this segment, but again, we're going to take these questions back because they are really good. And we want to make sure we respond to the people who've asked them um, after the fact, but I will end with uh, anything you're really excited about in research um, that you want to share uh, that's, that's, being done anywhere in the world, including Canada with its uh, great leadership here. Um, and you may not have something, but is there anything that's kind of really interesting? Somebody was talking about precision medicine as well in, in yeah. terms of, so I open it up to you, Dr. Sutherland, if you have anything you want to yeah. share. Um, on that kind of question about the genetic testing that's going to drive our medication choices, that will come eventually. I don't know of any sort of imminent use of that in our, our near future, but that will come. I know it will in my practice I'm sure in life um exciting things like all of these medications which have been life-changing for our patients are being studied for so many other conditions which have been very stubborn to treat so hydrogenase superativa which is a really awful disease that is very distressing for people we're trying all these medications for that and then we're getting access to these medications for so many different related conditions and I think just having more choices and more options and being able to help our patients more, that's what I'm most excited about. Great. Dr. Chandran, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, from a rheumatology point of view, you know, we look at dermatology and now they're talking about the clinical trials and in clinical practice, the goal of treatment is complete clearance of skin. So uh, what we call a PASI 100, right? Mm -hmm. But in rheumatology, we are still struggling with, and the clinical trial targets are not 100 or a 75, but 20% improvement. So, and so uh, despite all these drugs that we are having, our patients still struggle despite treatment with ongoing joint pain and inflammation. So mm -hmm. that's a big challenge. And what, um, although dermatology use one drug and it usually helps clear, and if not, there are other drugs that might help it. And so it's rare in a properly treated patient to see a lot of inflammation, but Despite biologics, we still see a lot of patients with active disease. Mm -hmm. And there was questions about, you know, how long these biologics last. Mm -hmm. And we see, especially in uh, psoriatic arthritis, that um, not everybody, but there are patients who, in, after initial response, the response falls off. So some of the uh, databases in, out of Europe tells us that about 50% of patients stop, it stops working in two years. And every year there is a further drop off. So over the years, what's happened is that we have a lot of patients with what we call difficult to treat or resistant disease who have tried multiple biologics and we are at kind we and newer drugs are really not making much of a difference. So these difficult to treat patients are now our big focus. We're thinking of combining biologics and there are clinical trials now doing that. We are uh, looking at other methods of trying to improve outcome. And of course, um, precision medicine is in the mix there. Uh, it's difficult, uh, it's early days, but we hope with precision medicine, in which case we get the right drug to the right patient earlier on and not you know, try different drugs and have a trial and error approach. Uh, uh, and that might reduce the number of patients who are resistant to treatment. And those who are resistant and not responding to therapies, we're looking at novel uh, combinations and other kind of therapies that might be useful, including, you know, um, say microbiome transplants and stuff like that. So uh, lots of stuff happening and uh, stay tuned. Very exciting. And um, thank you both so much again. Thank you to everyone who attended and who participated in questions. We don't have a lot of time for questions. That's true because this is, you know, these are short sessions, but I will, I, I've copied them all just to make sure in case Zoom, um, I don't want to lose them. So I have them all and uh, we can commit to uh, working with our, our, our experts to try to answer them and post them on our, our site, like I mentioned with the recordings. Um, so because we do want to respect the time our translator is, is doing live interpretation uh, and it's getting late in some parts of Canada. So thank you so very much again to everyone. Um, I want to remind everyone, you know, this is general information only. We all do respond differently to treatments and it's we hope that you can take something back to have an informed conversation with your healthcare provider uh, about your needs, your health history, your circumstances, and what could work better for you if you're if you're feeling like you you need to have that conversation. Um, and 
you know, this information is on our website as well. So if you need to go back and look at anything, we welcome you to. Thank you so much again. We're going to be sending out an evaluation. If you have a couple of minutes to fill it out, you help us uh, do better. Um, and with that, I thank everyone and wish you all a very uh, nice evening and uh, thank our experts again for joining us. Thank you.